What you have is a Seth Thomas number 10 weight driven pendulum regulated timepiece. It's about as green as you're going to get because it runs on gravity. And what it does is the weight of this weight coming down transfers power to this system underneath, driving the wheels in the form of a letter Y. The power coming up from the weight branches off into two directions. One direction is driving the hands and branching off. The other direction is to your pendulum. So your pendulum will be your heartbeat. It will tell you if anything is wrong here. In terms of sensitivity, one finger, I just stopped the clock. So you'll have to set the seconds. Yeah, it's going to say I got to do that again. That's okay. The whole point is, it's so sensitive that you can stop the clock here with one finger. Just by stopping here, there. You stop it. It means that it's probably the best union you could ever have because your problem could be uh, caused outside with the dials. Stops the clock. Everybody works or nobody works. That's simple. So if we have a hand that's frozen to seize, it's going to starve the escapement. The escapement will stop turning. Clock will stop. So it's designed with power to power consumption balanced. If you shift that balance, the clock says, I'm going to stop or I'm going to, not going to keep time. Fix me. If the clock was electric as it was before, all of the, it was in, none of this stuff is, this is all new. Up in here, what it would do is drive the, the physical clock backwards, driving this, driving the hands and all that sort of good stuff. But the point is, once something seized, like a bad bearing or iced hands, that electric motor, nobody said, slow down, I'm going to stop. It kept going and it started destroying pieces all the way up and about. It had too much torque. Because the power to power consumption is no longer balanced. Electric motors kill these clocks, big time. So we've been making our living the last 35 years, traveling the country, converting them back to a weight-driven, pendulum-regulated timepiece. In all cases, we recommend that the piece be re relocated to an area where the general public can see it, because the educational benefits are overwhelming. Galileo is in this, John Harrison is in this, Sir Edmund Beckett Dennison is in this, and scores of others, and hundreds and hundreds of years of technology that these guys develop are in your clock. So for an educational standpoint in schools and that type of thing, we recommend strongly. And, and Betsy knows that there's a lot of detail that she can keep right on going, John Harrison's pendulum and then all kinds of things. So here's the way it works. So this weight comes down, pulls on this cable, and drives a, a gear down here and starts driving the chain that drives the center wheel and driving the escapement. What controls the action of the hand is the pendulum. So the pendulum is nothing but a controlling device. As it swings uh, to one side to the other, it releases one tooth, which advances your hands two seconds, two seconds, two seconds. That's all your hands moving, two seconds. So us nutty old uh, clock makers, we travel around the towns and look up and see the hands and if they advance, we know it's a, it's a pendulum clock and we say, well, gee, that's a one and a half seconds pendulum. That, we're bored. But I mean, that's what we look at, see? And if it's moving smoothly, we know it's an electric timepiece. Once the piece is electrified, well, as, in, in, as in this case, it's good for 20 years and it literally destroys itself. And I showed Betsy one of the gears where it just, it's just worn out. It shouldn't wear out. The, the original pieces were produced in the 1350s, 1300s. They're still running. So there's no reason why your clock shouldn't be in the, the same situation if it's properly maintained. So we all have an obligation to this as a piece of history. That's what this is all about. And I, as a clockmaker, take the technology and the mistakes that were made here and improve upon them without modifying them, without uh, uh, compromising its historical value. I had to make uh, uh, changes in your clock. And here's why. Normally this track is about 10, 10 feet up. All these sprockets that are up top there, the chain was driven from here to that first sprocket and down and then the weight was all a continuous chain system. 
the auto wind was mounted here, it's over there in the corner, would wind this weight up and down. That's all fine and dandy and works good. Actually, it's Christian Huygens' continuous rope system. Problem is, there's no place to attach the track at that point. So the installers added another section so that they could attach it to your ceiling. But the, then they left all the sprockets on the very top. You'll see it in your diagrams. And so all the chains had to all go up to the top. Well, you get that much chain yeah, hanging pretty, there. Yeah, pretty difficult to maintain when it's way up there. I mean, you'd be real lucky if you could reach over from the ladder. And we suspect a lot of those bearings didn't get oiled. So what happens, the chain slips off, and guess what, the weight came crashing down, and all of this stuff's got smashed, the midsection got smashed. This a piece you see in the middle was originally on the top of the clock. So all the chains, and you see in your diagram, went all the way up, and you only used the upper part anyway. So they had a stop switch mounted there, and a, I mean a start switch halfway up, and a stop switch at the very top. And that's where all the weight was, 450 to 500 pounds. Yeah, I got a problem with that because this was nothing but pipe. It's soft too. And so we had all that weight and when the weight came crashing down it just broke all these pieces and shattered, shattered the base and the piece halfway through it was uh, broken into five sections. Cast iron. I can't put that back. So I, in fulfilling my obligation to Annie and Betsy and the people that hired us what I did is I restored everything, and we, Chris and I and Linda, don't want to forget Linda, we don't know what we do without her, uh, and including in the technology. Chris and I, we all got together and looked at this thing and said, why are we making something that we know failed? It makes no sense at all, because Einstein said it. Doing things the same way over and over again and expecting a different outcome is the definition of insanity. So guess what? We said, we'll change it. So we donated to your project everything you see underneath the clock. That's about the only commercial you're going to get from me. This motor drives the chain system with a square arbor that drives this great wheel that has springs in it that drive the center wheel. So instead of having the chain going all the way up there, it only goes right there. Can I have the crank? So the, the other, one of the problems you had before is you couldn't, you couldn't let down the power or you couldn't uh, wind up the power on the other clock. You'd have to go to the auto wind and there was a little crank there and it just, it's, so what we can do, what you can do now, if you so wish, to service the clock, you can let that weight down. If you let down the weight, it's like turning off your car. You, go ahead and crank it. See? It's winding up the weight. That means if you pull out the paws and the great wheel, we can point that out to you. It's also in your manual. You can pull those paws, just hold those out and let the weight down. Yep. So you shut off the auto wind, let the weight down, let her stop. You can start taking it apart and cleaning it. Put it back the way you found it and up she goes again. If you want it to automatically wind, we have an automatic wind system that will do it automatically. So watch this. It's on, on. This will be mounted someplace, and the wires are only temporary. So what happens is the weight comes down. It'll hit this switch. The motor is on. You've got 60 seconds to get out of the way. Now, you may confuse that with the elevator. But if you're there working on the clock, you, you should know. We thought about putting some kind of light on it or some explosive device or something there that would let you know that you shouldn't work on it or get the heck out of the way or go up with a weight or whatever. One way or another, we said, well, we'll give her 60 seconds. That'll be enough time for you to get out of the way. Now, when it goes to wine, you will know it. It has a very subtle sound to it. You can barely hear it. You won't even, won't make any noise at all. Wrong. We about 30 seconds into that? You know, I should have timed it. <laughs> to do that. One thing for your purpose is it takes 40 seconds to, from this point to the shutoff switch. So what happens? This starts the motor, 60 seconds later, it engages the clutch and starts to whine. So I'm still... <laughs> Subtle, huh? <laughs> the whole point is I shut it off here. If you want, we can go all the way. But it will hit that switch that's the black one. It'll hit that switch and shut off this, uh, the relays in it. 
We all know that switches fail. I mean, they do fail, mechanics fail. So what are we gonna do? We gotta have a safety. You never had a safety on it. So see that red thing? It's got a little wire that goes up and over the top. When that switch fails, the shut off switch fails, this pulley will continue up and hit that wire. When it hits that wire, it pulls a key out, plop. So if you come to work someday and see that key dangling, something failed. It says, fix me, doesn't destroy anything. The clock will continue to run. You'll come in and it'll be sitting down there because it won't wind until that uh, key is put back in. That's your safety. Fair enough? I haven't got any huh or any of the what? The, the key part is the red piece, correct? That, that's right, exactly right. So you can- It'll keep the clock from damaging itself. That's right. So the wire will come out of the top of the red piece? And what will come out is a key in it. Okay. It pulls the key out. And you'll see the key dangling there so if it fails. So there's nothing can happen until you reenact that key. In correct, the except the clock will continue to run because the weight will come back down. But once it gets down here and hits that switch, it's gonna do nothing until you fix it. Right. What the problem is. Right. It's says hands, fix like me. Bed here, something stuck in here. Right. Whatever. But you have to do an analysis of what happened. Right. Something happened. Remember, go. everybody works or nobody works. So it could be that hand over there that's seizing, saying, I'm not going to turn. And that stops that one, that one, and that one, and that escapement. Essentially, you can then crank it back up. You can. If the power goes out, have at it. You can crank it. I left you a crank. It's even a Seth Thomas crank. The handle's not beautiful, but I wasn't, it's strictly for servicing, but that's up to you. During the uh, ice storm in 98, we uh, had already built a clock for uh, Colby College and their nice big uh, Miller Library on campus. And it was, you know, a good sized tower clock, certainly not quite this size, but uh, when they had the power outage, which was for a very extended amount of time, they were actually manually winding the clock and they kept it going. It was the only thing working on campus. It's kind of cool. So, I mean, you get the best of both worlds. If you get up there and wind it, you can still keep it going even if you don't have electricity. What's, what's the length of time? So, that's, that's a rule that it takes for the weight to go from the top to the bottom. We haven't done the math on it yet. <laughs> a day? Four days? Somewhere in the range of two to three times a day it's going to wind. Yeah, it's probably about eight, eight hours maybe. Oh. Okay. okay. And if you're demonstrating, hit the switch. You can show them. No, I just meant like you wouldn't know where the weight was, whether it was, had just wound or was right here. You don't know. Yeah. I did design it so that the switch hits if the power's out. Once it hits the switch, you have so many hours Got before it. you have to wind it again. So you have time. In other words, it, it, you'll have time. It's under an hour. Yeah. And if you would like. <laughs> Eight hours, okay. give or take. That's what I was it's about eight hours. Okay. It, it made me vary a little bit. If we haven't clocked that, we were we were more for now. Well, you you can set a timer on there if you like. I apologize. We did, that's one piece of data we can't give you. Oh, because we didn't know where those switches were going to be. Remember, we. Now here's another thing you need to know. Totally assembled and operating. We never saw it run. We, we've never seen this clock run before. Yeah. So your guess is as good as ours. Okay. We do know how they function and how this should function and all that kind of good stuff. But this is the first time for us. In fact, we're all... Well, we also realized that there's another thing that was on. And apparently they were using that to run the clock that they were all full of weights and so when you started putting stuff on the weight on, you're operating with 20 about what 25 percent or 20 percent less weight than it did before we had no idea what it would take yeah no it was too many assumptions see we we assumed that the bearings were aren't frozen 
we had all, uh, most of the bearings on this clock were frozen. And that's because the oil systems never, it never got oiled properly. That wasn't your fault. It's just that you couldn't oil it. Okay, so the drive from the center wheel of the clock. This center wheel is it's also connected to your pilot dial. And we can go on from there, but the pilot dial tells you what time it is outside. Do not set the clock by turning your finger on the pilot dial. You don't touch, it's been done. <laughs> I know, I know. I gotta say it, man. We've seen it a hundred times. But the pilot dial is what it is, so you can pilot this clock. So it tells you what time it is outside. And you connect that straight through, and we hook to this gear, driving this gear, follow it up, and it branches into four different directions. Each one of those shafts is turning one revolution per hour. Questions? Because so, it's very difficult to see outside to see with the hands say, you really have to have a pilot. You have to have a pilot. Minutes and everything. <laughs> so, what's the ratio of the hour hand to the minute hand? 12, 12 to 1. Wouldn't think of it that way. You say, oh, 60, uh, no. This shaft turns one revolution per hour. We need to gear it down to drive the hour hand. So remember the hour hand only makes two revolutions in a day, right? True? So, but we cycle on 12 hours. So we have this shaft turning one revolution per hour and the tube that's inside this to the hour hand turning one revolution per 12 hours. The ratio is 12 to one. Unless you're military, it's 24 to one, right? But it's, it's principally the same thing. So those gears up there called motion work gears do nothing but reduce this by 12 to one driving the, t the pipe called the hour pipe. Your technology, you'll learn that inside the clock. Uh, uh, inside the housing. That hour pipe is attached to that largest wheel you see up there. Questions? What would cause the clock to stop working? Uh, how about a... How, a bird, a pigeon? Nah, probably with the torque of this monster, I doubt it. But ice, like ice. Ice? Ice is the worst so, thing. Remember, one's turning slowly and the other one's turning faster and they're turning at two different rates. You get water in there and see, start to see, multiply that times four, could very easily stop the clock. Now the clock system itself is used to those hands being a certain amount of weight. If you have an ice storm and the weight on those hands is 20 pounds more, what kind of effect would that have on the clock? Well, you tell me. It would stop. That's potentially right. It depends on where those 20 pounds are. If it's, if it's equally distributed on the hand to the point where it still remains balanced, okay, then you might be okay. That's not likely to happen though. Okay, let's put it this way. If they're all at, at see it's quarter past three, then you put all the weight out here, it's gonna push down, forcing more torque back through here and making that escapement snap more because that's where it all winds up, right? The heart. And you multiply that times four, it's going to be overpowered, literally. But say quarter of nine, it's going to put, and it's all iced up from overnight, it's going to push down there times four, it's going to starve. Your escapement will be just barely snapping over, right? And that will change your rate. But you do have one thing working for you, and that is you got black hands. And what happens to black hands when the sun hits it? Together, they warm up real quickly, and that ice just comes right off. And that's why so that, that, that helps. Is there any way to de-ice the hands if you ever have a problem? That's your only way. So this time, time and sunshine. Yep. And the east will free up first, <laughs> usually. Yeah. That's why you see chimneys bend over slightly. Up north we have a lot of chimneys that are bent over like that. That's because they freeze up for the moisture and the sun hits one side first. And it's weird, so all these chimneys are like that. Okay, so this is called motion work. This, uh, your manual uh, uh, will, or dial gears, you might hear me say. Your dial gears have to be oiled at a given period of time. Originally, there was an oil port at the hour wheel, that's the biggest, there was an oil port there with a tube sticking out of it. You probably remember that. We changed that to a, uh, a flexible tube, and it's attached to, and I can show you that, and so we'll get a ladder out if you like, a couple of seconds, but the whole point is, uh, when oil was put in that tube, it was expected to run through the hour tube all the way to the end and, out and oil the uh, minute shaft. What do you think? Do you think that happened? There's one of them right there. 
You think that oil's going to go all, it's going to drip all the way down the end? By the time the oil got down to the end, it was gummy and plugged up the holes. And so you were never oiling the outer bearings. Never. Never got there. So the question is, how can we put oil in that particular area and be assured that it gets to the other area? We have a high-tech system. <laughs> so you fill that tube up with oil. It's got a fitting on it. You fill that tube. Too complicated here, right? You fill that tube up with oil. You fill it up a couple times if you want. And this is normally goes on to an autumn <laughs> tire. I'm making fun. I'm picking on you. But the whole point is, you blow that sucker, and trust me, if that tube is plugged up inside there, it's going to blow it right out, and the oil will be exactly where it has to be every time. I've tested it. We, that has a long tube inside of it to carry a roller bearing. So, and it only uses a short uh, uh, section of it for the roller bearing. And the other section was never used. So we pulled this whole sleeve out, it had been worn. So we pulled this whole sleeve out and said, we'll just flip the whole sleeve over and put it back in and use the other end. Well, when we pulled it out, we found somebody had already used the other end. So that made for a funny, so we had to make some new tubes and pop them in there, it hadn't planned on it, it doesn't matter, to make sure that it gets the oil. Now here's the problem with oil, this type of oiling. You have an entry point, but you gotta have an exit point. In other words, you can't just leave the oil in there. You gotta have a place for it to exit. So we use an AMSOIL, an AMSOIL product, and we use it because it stays uh, pourable at 35 below zero. I don't know how cold it gets here, but it stays liquid, is the whole point. And it will uh, suspend all the products and run out. There were no exit ports for your oil. So, yeah, I know, so it all stayed in. Imagine that all the other year. So it, no wonder it wore, be, because the oils and the old particles stayed in there and just ground up the bushing. Golly, I guess we better, better change it. So what we did is we cut exit ports on the outside. No, because once it gets where it's going, you're just blowing air. Okay. Have pump away. You're not going to hurt it. Did you, did you see that uh, blue black tube? Well, I guess somebody kept it. That little round thing. Oh, this is what you had. Nama nama. <laughs> this is what you had on the front of this housing. That held the oil and all the ucky stuff in it. This is the stuff that they've been oiling that you want to drain out. So we cut oil ports, exit ports, on those housings and those bearings. So you blow oil in it or air, but just pop it to it. You can't over oil it because by the time it gets down to the ground, nobody's going to have a bad hair day. <laughs> It'll, and besides the stuff, that AMS oil is, is water soluble, so it's, it's harmless, it's good, it's good stuff. And I've converted Yale, Harvard, Duke, Williams, Vassar, all the major college, colleges in New England onto this system, and we've had superior luck. We, ran, we have to run our own experiments. The reason why is because we found that the, the, the oil companies all say that theirs is the best. What are you going to do with that? So you run your own experiments. So we ran certain oils through this type of system, and we found some oils would seize because they'd pick up the dirt. So the minute we converted to AMSO, it freed up. We didn't have the problem anymore. So I'm, I'm giving you close to a gallon of that stuff. You can buy it locally. If you have any problems, we'll work that out. You not use the same type of material for that gasket, right? It came out of your bearing. Now, we put a rubber disc on the outside. Uh, to prevent water from getting in, but there's yes. still a port behind it for the oil to exit. Exit. So we don't want water to get in, but it won't anyway. Very sticky. Oh, it's nice. It smells well, oniony. Yeah. The, the other problem. You can wash your hand. Comes right off. That's an old. That's an old felt gas. It is. It, yeah. Right. It was replaced with a rubber and then a secondary. No, just rubber. Just rubber. Just one. Because inside, inside of it, inside it, it's got to be able to get out. Inside of it is an insert anyway. Okay. And all this is co covers that and see I say seals, just covers it, keep the water from coming in, but so the oil can it's drain more out. A weather seal than anything else. That's all it is. Okay, but so it's a rubber insert with oil? No, it's just it's a donut.
just like that is, only it's a rubber donut. Surface, but the surface that it fits flat against is undercut on one spot for oil gotcha. to drain out. Now, being the hour pipe, it's only going to drain once every 12 hours, but that's okay. That's all it needs. Okay. Um, one of the things that we found when we took these off, when we were originally disassembling all these dials, is these rings were soaked with water. I mean, not only were they soaked with oil, they were also soaked with water. And the problem with that is it's holding water. What's it going to do? It's going to rust things. And the shaft had a lot of rust around it, but, okay, you know. So you added, you added drains, uh, drain ports to the hour pipe. Yeah. Yep. And the main housing. So you, what you have is you have this housing, you have a hour pipe that's inside that, and a minute shaft that's inside that. So there are really two sections that have drain ports. Okay. Not to mention the ones you have inside here. Those are drips. That's what they're made for. So the oil will you uh, shoot in here will drain out and will drip here. And golly, looks like it's been there before. Sorry. Would there ever be a time? You can hang a bucket or something on it. Would there ever be a time if the clock was completely froze up that you wouldn't want to restart it and just wait a day or two for the ice to melt off of it before That's restarting? I've the never. Clock? Well, you, the, the heart will tell you. Okay. Your, clock, your escapement will tell you because if it's uh, seized up and you start it, it won't go. Because so your power, remember, your power to power consumption ratio is so close enough where if there's anything seizing on it, and all run. So it's fix me. So you should wait. I mean, well, if it doesn't start, then yeah, you gotta wait. Okay. So there could but be a time frame that you have to leave it down. Generally hours. Generally hours. Unless we have. I don't know what you have for weather, but nor we Sometimes have. Sometimes we can have some pretty bad. Ice like sub-zero weather for several days or gotcha. something like that. Okay. You'll I, know. You'll I, know I have time. found with the clocks that I do up in Portland um, that. Of course, I, mine's more compounded by uh, snow packing in the bottom of the clock face because the face is recessed a little bit. So I have to wait for that all to melt and then the hand can clear it. But a lot of times it's just glazed hands. And usually as soon as the sun comes out, within a few hours it frees it up, at least on a few of the dials until it gets warm enough to take it all off. If, so yeah, you could be waiting as much as a day. If there is a forecast for a major ice storm, should someone come up here and hang out with the no. It's not going to do you any good because it's out of, your, out of your control. You can't do anything about it. It will let you know. Sometimes they chug through it. I've seen them run Sure. Out. Most of them they do. And that's if it is, is the same amount on each one. If well, no. No. What we're saying is, is your escapement's going to tell you. Your escapement's going to tell you whether it's going to keep running or not. If it doesn't run, it's not going to run. You, you probably won't lose three hours. Besides, your, your storms tend to be directional anyway, so yeah, you're only going to get it on a couple of dials. You know, on average, sometimes three, but usually just two dials. Now, you have another tube on the front that requires the same thing. On the front part of this housing, it's on top. It's only about this long. Take an oil gun and shoot a little oil in it. And after we get through with this, if you want to come up and I'll take you up and we'll do this one if you want. Doesn't matter. Can't over oil it. Except Betsy gets to clean it up. That's the only problem with that. Yeah, I'd like, to, I'd like to see how you do that. So, well, how I clean it up or how Betsy cleans it up? Oh, right. <laughs> no man. Okay, there is a manual. I just, I want to interject this. We can all, for the most part, answer your questions. But when you call us, because we take countries from all the country, actually all over the world, even from other countries and so on. But if you're gonna, if you're gonna call us, Go to the manual and learn the techno technology. Uh, the thingy, the thingy that turns the the uh, thing that turns the that doesn't work. I mean, I got it here. I look it up. Find there's pictures in there with arrows in it. Use the terms so I'll know what the heck you're talking about, and we can expedite this thing. I've been getting telephone calls on this clock for 20 years. I was telling Betsy a little while ago, and they didn't know the terminology at all. <laughs> They did send me a videotape. We, we've had people call us before, and I, I'd get the call first and talk to the person, get an idea of what they thought, thought what the problem was, and I'd put him on, and he got something totally different out of it, yeah. just because they were using the wrong terminology. So the manual is your friend. It's our friend, too. <laughs> RTFM, right? RTFM. RTF, read the manual. <laughs> is that what that is? Okay, we have any questions? Uh, I think you went over. I'll be glad to do it again. Let's hit. Let's hit it. I couldn't see when you were going 
Pilot dial. We're going to go around the other side. Okay, so you can tell you can you as the pilot are going to see what's going on outside. I'm going to show you that. But this is the key thing. The thing I want to get in part to you is that the way the clock works is everybody works or nobody works. So if you have stoppage on your clock, somebody somewhere is betraying us. <laughs> okay. And if you have to have any kind of machining done, be sure that you call us or talk to us because there are techniques that your machinists do not use. Let me give you a case in point. One of the bushings that was slid in there where the shaft is turning, what they did is they slid a tube in there, which is all right, bronze tube, and they cut rings in it, complete rings. Well, if you cut a complete ring, the oil goes in that little ring and stays. So they had a series of rings full of metal particles and dried up oil cutting rings into the shaft. So the shaft had rings cut all in it. If they had spiraled that little groove all the way on the inside of the tube, it would have worked itself out. And when you oiled it, it would have worked itself out. So the machinist, although he did his best, cuts continuous rings. And that's not the way. You've got to spiral it. They're called journals if you have a, any interest in that kind of stuff. So the thing is, there are things that we need to impart to you. Another one is, if, if it gets bushed, we take a tapered reamer. That's a tapered cutter. And you run it in one side and you ream it. And then you go to the other side and ream it. So that makes a cross section of the hole sort of like that. That's a cross section of the hole. The reason for it is because to say these two shaft ends are perfectly straight, I'm sorry. They're, they're, not, they're good, but they're not that good. So if there's a misalignment ever so slightly, it won't make any difference. The clock will still run. And also when you oil it, there's a place for the oil to stay inside on both sides. Machinists don't know this. Clockmakers do. So and with all due respect to the machinists, they're wonderful people and we've run. Let me put it this way. I pulled out a number 17 Seth Thomas, 3,800 pounds out of Williams College where they had the finest German machinists they could. And he made these bushings and they couldn't keep the clock running and they wanted it completely restored. So we took it back to our shop and I, all we did is took the original bushings, ream, 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 stuck it back on there and the clock ran. It's all because they didn't, they didn't understand. We had to restore it anyway, but the whole point is that it would run just with that reaming. That makes a difference. And then if you're a watchmaker, you have that kind of interest, that's standard practice in watchmaking. Now, going back to your stoppage thing, there is a protocol of sorts that you follow when you come in from trying to diagnose what the problem is. So if you come up here and you find the clock's dead, the first thing you look at is the weights and see if the weights are sitting down and that will tell you you got an electrical problem. It didn't wind itself up. So then you start looking to what that is. So if the weights are still up in the air, the clock's dead, then you're looking either at this or you're looking at the physical clock itself. So there will be a certain um, you know, train of thought that you'll take when you start approaching it and just take your time and look at one thing after another and determine where your power loss is. Okay, can we take, take short, we're gonna set up a ladder for that and we're gonna oil that dial gear. Then we can work into the physical mechanism, okay? All right, we're just going to set this ladder up. Yeah. Okay. All right. To oil. To oil. Start from the beginning. So we got a bushing back here, a little flange bushing made of bronze, and on the top of it there's a little journal hole here. So stick the thing in there, pump a little oil in it, fill up the hole. That takes care of that one. Further forward, there's another one in here between the gear and the big bushing that's in front of it. It's mounted to this housing. You'll see it, there's a little arrow there. And you stick the oil in that, pump a little oil into it. I'll come back to the one where we're going to use the pump. Further down, we've got the minute wheel. It too has oil journals right on the top of the bushing. So there's one here for the rear bushing, and there's one on the front side for the front bushing. And you are gonna have a little bit of drippage afterwards. Got good in shake. This one's tough to move though. All right, so then up top here, on this gear, you'll see mounted, and it can be in any position because this gear is constantly turning. There's an oil uh, tube up here. As you'll see, there's one down here at the end as well. 
So what we're going to do is you unscrew the cap off of it, which is the same thing as you find on your fill-up for your tires. We take the cap off. Don't lose the cap because you want to make sure that you keep any foreign particles from getting in there. So take the oil and you're going to pump oil in there. You're going to see it go through the tube and fill the tube up. And then usually I pull the oiler right out and I let this drain all the oil into it. Once that has happened, huh? Oh, yeah, that's true. All right. Let me bring our pump up. We attach the pump. Well, that wasn't very good. Let's try that again. There we go. Attach the fill-up to it. Slip that on. And we start pumping. And that's it. Blows the oil through the other side. <coughs> You're all done. You put the cap back on. And of course, like we said, there's another one down there by the dial. You see the tube sticking out. You do the same process for that, and that basically uh, does the outer bearing. And those are the only two that have. Uh, What's that? Those are the only two the oil ports. Those are the only two that require the pump. Okay. Is there oil points on the on the poles? Are they turning as well? Those are the only two that turn as well. Yeah. Yeah, that one will stay put because that's the housing. The green is the housing. Okay. So this one is attached to a large tube that goes outside. And this pinion you see here and shaft here are attached to a thick shaft that goes all the way outside that sticks out. And that's what your minute hand is attached to. If there's not enough oil in the one over here towards I see our hand, if there's not enough oil in there, would that allow water to come in? I don't think no matter what you do, water is going to get in anyway. Um, but because there's a drain, it can get back out again. Not to mention, we put a shield over it. Yeah, well, we've reduced the amount of water that can come in. But let's face it, when you're 200 feet up, you're going to get wind. And wind is going to blow water anywhere it wants to go. So, so, so blowing out that one is a little bit more important than this one, you think? Because of the well, these are two different, these are two different bearings. So in other words, when you're hitting this one here, you're really doing the minute shaft. And when you're hitting that one out there, you're really doing the hour pipe that go, or tube that goes out. So you're, there's two separate bearings. The thing to note is that tube goes all the way through the center and oils the minute hand shaft. All the way through. That's why you pump it through. All the way yeah, it's like six feet long. That one only, only has to travel that far. So yeah, a couple of pumps, doesn't matter. You can't over oil it. Yeah, it's got little copper tubes that go in all the way to the other end. So that when we're pumping this oil, it's going through that tube all the way to the other end to oil that bearing. And inside there, there's a, uh, uh, it's a roller bearing. Both of them have like cage type roller bearings, uh, for one for the minute shaft and one for the hour pipe. So you're basically feeding oil into that to keep it happy. And then as time goes on, that stuff's flowing out and being taken by the wind. <laughs> That's basically it. So a happy clock is a working clock. That's right. I've checked the manual on this one. How often was that? Did we ever look? Yeah. This one's, the reason why I don't have a direct answer for you right now is because this clock is so much more unique than the average clock that we deal with. Most of the ones like up, you know, that we deal with where you have these types of gears, they're usually so much smaller, you know, for like a five, six, seven foot dial. Usually those, those dial gears only weigh like, I don't know, 15 pounds, something like that. And these are like 350 pounds. These are, these are so much bigger. Oh yeah, these things weigh a lot. But, um, okay, so I, I was wondering why you could just grab one and it doesn't affect He can grab and sit on it. Those are three, actually they're th about 375 pounds each. If, that, if this wasn't hooked up to the shaft, I mean, I could start moving the hands and stuff. You gotta, you gotta torque it a little bit, but you can move them. Thing is, he, 
Yeah. He shook things. Can you grab the shake? You can drop that. Uh, I don't think I can move the minute one. It's got too much. Oh, yeah, it moved. Yep, I can move it. Can you hear it? Nothing complicated. Simple, simple, simple. <coughs> just got to hit all the spots. You'll, you'll memorize where they are. For every, every shaft, there's two ends. If you, you can follow it right up. There's just every time you see a shaft, hit both ends of it. And one of them will be out there, and the other one will be out there, and the, you get the, both ends on this end. Also, when you're done oiling, it's never a bad idea to uh, wipe the excess coming off because it's just going to drip on the floor, or better yet, it's going to drip on your head when you forget about it and walk underneath it. <laughs> and it's happened to us before many times. We talked about the letter Y. We've said that the, 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 the base of the Y, the root of the Y was the weight, the power source. And we said that once the power was transmitted up through the clock, part of it went through what you've just seen, which was all the hands. Now we're going to talk about the other, y, the other time. That's the escapement. Now all this does, it's real simple, all it does is allow one tooth to escape, which advances all the hands two seconds. It's, as I said, it's very sensitive. If you were to lift this off, I'm screw you up. If you could lift this off, now all the, hand, whoops, all the hands are freewheeling. All the hands were turning. Watch this. I'm going to hold these up. Now all the hands right now as we're talking are going backwards. So this controls it all. So we know that if we can release this at every two seconds, then that would allow the hands to advance two seconds. And that's done by gear ratios from the center wheel. Remember we said this turns one revolution per hour. So, uh, a gear ratio up to the escapement, which drives the pendulum. Pendulum does not drive anything. It is a driven. So what drives the pendulum, if you watch these, step over, come on up, you, can, you don't have to hide. You'll know one pin lifts up and the other drives. Is there much force on that? Well, let's put it this way. Go Stop the, the uh, pendulum. Here, my hand? Yeah, go ahead. I, I, you can use one finger if you want. Uh, we're waiting. Wow. We're waiting. Wow. Stop the pendulum. Yeah, wow. I'm amazed. Can you stop the pendulum? No. Okay. Let me tell you what's driving it. I'm going to put my finger here and stop this. What's driving it is the weight of this arm leaning against it. Pick the arm up. That's what's driving your pendulum. Yeah, that's great. Wow. You come, that's come right on in. You've got to be comfortable. Come, come right in. You get comfortable with this. That's insane. So the weight of this arm leaning against the pendulum is all that drives it. Go ahead, stop the pendulum. Put, put your arm in there. Go ahead. No, you can't do it with one finger. You can. Yeah, you could probably do it. It's still, it's still, it's still tough. Tough, huh? Yeah. Okay, you want to pick up that pin? Pull the pin. Feel the weight of this pin. Okay, now I'm going to let it go, and you'll see one raise up and the other drive, right? Okay, now watch. See one raised up? See? Now, we knew, because we didn't have any diagrams of this, that the distance from this point was, uh, was to here because of the wear marks. We knew that they, they let the ivory wear off and they put something else in there, but that's elephant ivory. It should have been ivory. They all were. Getting a, a elephant ivory in this country is like pulling tusks. <laughs> all right, I'm sorry, I didn't mean that. Now, daylight saving time. You gotta rewind the clock back an hour or ahead an hour. Okay, we're gonna go to that. Okay. What you need to understand is how it works first. So what happens is this gear drives this pinion. Wheels are the big ones. Pinions are the steel driven. Drivers versus driven. So this driver on the center wheel drives the pinion on the third wheel with the, uh, uh, and pinion on the third wheel. And the third wheel drives the pinion on the fourth wheel. This is new because yours were worn out. And this wheel drives the escapement. What is this funny fan thing? What it does is it's a brake, it's a damper. You don't oil it. You might once in a while, but see, it hits it and absorbs the shock of the tooth striking this little device called a pallet. Because we don't want it to bounce. We want it to hit and stick. And this absorbs that shock. See how it does it? That's all it does. So this absorbed by wind and by its, its mass will keep the, the escape tooth from bouncing on the pallet. The reason for that is, it's because if it bounces, it changes how high this lifts. 
We want it to be in the same place every time so it gets the same amount of impulse so that the arc of the pendulum remains the same. Why? Because Galileo said so. He said no matter how far it goes, it'll be the same. But he was wrong. He was proven wrong in 1851. Doesn't matter. We don't have to go there. The point is we want a constant amount of power being driven to the pendulum so the arc of the pendulum is the same at all times so that the rate and the hands all turn at the same rate. We vary that by varying the arc of the pendulum or its length that will change the rate. Another way, have you ever seen a little cuckoo clock go tick, 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 annoying little things? Some people love them, but, but you look at this one, how slow it is. So it should tell you the longer the pendulum is, the slower it ticks. That should tell you that if you want to make it slower, slow the clock down, you need to make the pendulum longer. Simple. And if you want the clock to go faster, you need to shorten it. This right here is screwed right onto the pendulum. So if you want to speed it up, we take this and turn it. I did it a quarter of a turn. We just speeded up the clock. But Chris has regulated it. I think it needed it. So that's if we find that the clock's either running slow or fast. Correct. And how do you know that? How are you going to know? By seeing it outside? You can't tell outside. Here's how you tell right here. Seconds bit. Set, set your watch to the seconds bit. This shifts. Does this, doesn't, this shifts, doesn't it? No. Ooh. So will you have to stop it and... Yeah, you stop the clock. Yeah. Just, you can just... You know how to stop it. And, and wait till it gets to that second. And then start it up so that you come in the next day and make sure it's agreed. And if it's off, make your adjustment. Now, down at the bottom of the pendulum, Bob, that big mass is a pointer. That pointer is for course adjustments. In other words, if you screw it up, is that going to speed it up or slow it down? That would slow it down. If you screw it up, it raises the bob. It's going to speed it up or slow it down? Speed it up. Speed it up because you're, you're shortening it. Okay? So the formula is complicated. Slow down, speed up. <laughs> Easy. Okay, so if you unscrew this, it lets it down. Slow it down, speed it up. That's so what it's going to do. It's so going to slow it down. So there's two ways to control Coarse and fine. Yep. So you, down there you go minutes, here you get into seconds, and I'm going to, cut, I'm going to throw you a curve. A pendulum, is, its length is not the total relevant point of the, of the pendulum. In other words, it's the balancing point. In other words, for a, for a pendulum to tick at sw or swing at two seconds, it must balance, lay it down and balance at 13 feet 8. If you're into math, I'll give you the formula, but there's no need of it. Seconds per tick times seconds per tick times 39.14. It'll come up to 13 feet 8. That pendulum should balance at 13 feet 8. So what you're doing is shifting the center of uh, gravity, the C of G, by raising the bob up or lowering it or, sh or making the whole thing longer or shorter or putting a penny here. Like they did in the old days. You can get it down to half seconds. You can do it down to half seconds by putting a penny, or you used to have a little thing here with a bunch of little weights, and it came with the clock, and you would put them in there, and that would act, uh, uh, make it very accurate to the mini, uh, half second a day or some, something like that. That's what that's your, called your shot cup. So it's better to put a coin up here than uh, the bob itself. Leave the bob. No, it's course adjustment. Once you get your course adjustment, you should never have to make more than a quarter of a turn in that a year in one direction. Yeah, the, the, the course adjustment, to be honest with you, is really used for the clockmaker when they wow. set the clock up because they had to take it apart. And it's lefty, loosey, righty, tighty. It's the same Basically. Thread. Yep, it's a right-handed thread. Okay. Wow. okay, now I'm going to throw you a little more technology and that's all. The problem with a pendulum this long is when it gets hot up here, metal gets longer or shorter. Right, it gets longer. Well, didn't I just slow down the clock? Oh, yeah. What happens if it gets cold in here? Sure. What is that everything you don't want? So what a guy by the name of John Harrison did is put a piece of zinc inside here, and it's configured so that when it gets hot, the steels get longer, the casement gets longer, but the zinc pushes it back up, keeping it at the same C of G distance. So you have a John Harrison zinc compensated pendulum. That's why you got to get air in it into the zinc. 
questions. So you had to have the right proportion of zinc to steel because they have fixed amount that each one expands, right? So, so if you could do the calculations, and I had to, and it's, see this ball spot? Anyway, the, that's, that's because of the calculations. You have to go so, through the proportion of zinc to steel so that the bob stays at the same C of G point. That's all we're talking about. So if we had like a 105 degree day outside, yeah. heaven forbid, yeah. would we have to come up and make adjustments on the clock because of the temperature? Depends on how well your pendulum co uh, zinc compensates. This is 100 years old. So it compensates itself. Let's sue Seth Thomas. I have no way of knowing. <laughs> we, we have no way of knowing that. Until this is all theory that I'm giving you to the way the pendulum was made, so right. it may compensate for so you. We'll know what happens. You, you, you're the guy. Besides, based on the math and everything, you're still basing that on the materials being pure. And who's oh, to yeah. say the steel and the zinc are all that pure? So there could be a little bit off in the, in the uh, uh, formula. Sometimes on other clocks before where we've had to restore pendulums, not necessarily Seth Thomas, but Howard ones, we found added pieces of zinc in there to make up for what they screwed up in the mat. Actually, you just got to slug a cast iron down the bottom. Yep. We haven't figured that is out. Is there an ideal temperature to keep the clock at? Just I'll get, the same temperature. There you go. Ideal is the same environment. That's why I told Keith, you can seal it up downstairs. It, that's why that slot is so narrow, because you don't want radical change. It, it likes cold. Oh, and it likes hot, but doesn't like them both. So it needs to be the same temperature in the pendulum box. If you can here. keep its environment constant, regardless of what it is, it's going to stay accurate for you. That's the secret. That's why if you can enclose it to keep the dust out or the environment, if you can put glass cages or whatever you can do to, to contain the environment, accuracy big time. Changes all the, all the rules. Okay. Clock is wrong. Shall we set it? Yeah, it's off like five, six, seven seconds, something. No, don't set that part. We need to, to get them to turn that. No, you can show them. So, so much, yeah, you might want to come around here. So, some way that you can see in through here. So as, w as you start with a pendulum, you've got a rough adjust, and then you have a fine adjust. Well, this is the same thing with setting the clock. Right here, there's this funny looking worm gear mounted on the side here. And on the ends of it, the shafts stick out, and there's a pin through it. And you might see there's like a little dial indicator on there. So basically, you've got this funny looking T-wrench that has a hole in it and a little slot cut in it. That fits on either end, whichever one you happen to be able to get to at the time. Because this is rotating all the time. And with this little wrench, you can turn this a little bit one way or the other. And if you look carefully outside, you might see the minute hand move. See that one over there? Okay, setting the hand backwards now. And it also moves the clock here. You can move it forward. Correct. Yep. Would you like to try it? Absolutely. Get to Make feel sure you the torque. Back where you found it. <laughs> yeah, we'll set it afterwards. We're gonna reset it. No, it's up to you. It just yeah, whatever you can get to. Watch the hand. And as that See how much you're moving it? All these gears up here. Yeah, just just look up. Bit. Look up. Wow. You're turning them all. You're turning everything. Wow. Memory, everybody's working. Wow. Yeah, so, I mean, that's just so amazing that that little bit of turn can move. Well, Somebody just keep in mind, that's the whole hour. Of course, you're also using a worm, so you're geared down. You're well. geared way down. Yeah. If you disconnected that and had to turn it here, you'd be cranking pretty hard. If you wanted to, and you had to advance three hours, I don't think you want to sit there and crank and crank. No. See, there's a T-wrench, and it goes right onto here. Loosen all of them. See right here, you can loosen, you loosen all three of them. Once they're all loose, you can turn this and it will turn them off. But it's better to do it with the worms. And then after you do that, make sure you enter the Mr. America contest. <laughs> it, it, it will, it takes a tug because you're turning everything. Right. I, I haven't done it yet, but I imagine it'd be pretty stiff. You, you can do it though, for like several, once you get it going, she's going to, oh, she's going to, because it's all balanced, she's going to move. So, we've got so just be careful when you do it. But you can do your rough adjustments there with this T-wrench. 
fingers. And your fine out. adjustments there. So this would be our minus or plus an hour if we had daylight savings time. Each one of those is a minute. Yes, you can do it that way, or you could stop the clock, or you can crank until one hour, 60 turns. So or you, well, when you would come up here, some people lift up the escapement. I don't recommend that you do this too often until you get the feel of this. But lift up the two arms, and the third person lets it free wheel, and that will advance it pretty quick for you, right? So you hold out the two things on the escapement. Careful, then, carefully, like I did. It'll probably take two people. You'll you'll learn to do that. Just be careful and then study it. Fool around with it and study it. I mean, it's it's okay to do the escapement arm thing, but you have to be real careful because what happens is that, that escape wheel gets going really fast, and if you drop those arms back in there, you could damage something. <laughs> so you may want to catch it with your fingers and just keep it from going too fast. Depending on where the hands are, correct? If they're up at an angle like this, then you've got... The balance. The balance. Yeah, and the, remember, the, the escapement is only going to move forward, so you're only going to... You're going to go forward. You'll have to go 12 hours or 11 hours. So it wouldn't okay. matter if it's 2 or 10 o'clock. It's pretty much the same. Okay, so we've gone through this. We see your pilot dial. It does. There's your 12 to 1 ratio gears here, just like out there in the dial. These gears drive this and drive the escapement. When you oil it, just take a shaft. Here's a shaft. See how loose it is? A little oil on one end, a little oil on the other. Here's it. A little oil on one, a little oil on the other. Yeah, it's got oil ports right here, so it drains right into the shaft. There's an oil port here, I believe. You see it right here? And there's one on the front here. Follow the shaft and get both ends of it. There's another one here. Follow the shaft all the way down. There's another one here. There it is on the other side. It's here. So now you've oiled the main train. After you get through, shake them. Should always have in shake. This is not a car, this is an old machine. So they need the in shake. That's so that one shoulder doesn't, uh, both shoulders of the shaft don't rub at the same time. If they do, it creates too much friction. Remember, we're trying to get as, as much power through this thing as possible without creating friction. If we have both shoulders of the shaft rubbing at the same time, that's not a good idea. So now you only got one, plus it'll shed the oil. Questions, now we've done the two Ys. Oh, if you need questions, see the stirrups, the loops? Those are funny looking things. The reason why um, those are there is if that suspension spring breaks, that they will catch the pendulum. Right, the pendulum won't drop to the ground. Right. Break. And you can replace the suspension. When you regulate, you should loosen those four screws ever so slightly. These right here. It's in your manual, just lightly loosen them because they're pinching that suspension spring. So just loosen them slightly and turn and give a turn. And then you get through, tighten them back. How long should the suspension spring last? Um, 200 years. Really? Depending on how you take care of it. What's it, like spring steel? It's exactly what it is. Wow. 200 years. Okay. The clock is complete just the way it is, except there's a, it needs a winding system. Talk about the winding system, it's real simple, except that we have to create the problems first before I give you the solutions. The problem is on a weight-driven clock, when you wind it, if you've got an old grandfather clock, I'm talking about 150 or 200 years old, when you wind it, the second hand goes backwards. It's because it's forcing power up through the train and then everything's going backwards. We need for something to maintain the power on the system while it's being wound. The system is called the Maintaining Power System. It was invented circa 1750 by John Harrison again. Okay, and what it's all about is inside here we have springs. And the pawl holding those springs is right here. That pawl is completely free. Let me take the crank. Reach your hands in there, you're safe. So what happens is those, those springs will take over and with that pawl, as soon as we start to wind. So I'm gonna do this. Now I've got the weight of that all on my, in my, I got it all right here. But those springs with that pawl that I can now not move now are driving your clock and all the hands. That is called a maintaining power system. We had to build it for your clock. There's springs in it. We did not, there's some just sitting in there, we did not know how much, how many springs and how strong you needed to be because we didn't know how much weight, we didn't know, we didn't know anything. 
So I made you a whole pile of springs and that's what there are over there in a the bag. There's a set of them in there and floating and there's instructions to change them should you need them. But the point is, while the clock winds, those springs will be driving your clock. See them inside? And they will hold it for about a minute and a half. So now we'll go to the wind system. Problem with the clock is when it winds, it's got to unwind. So everything you put, if I put a gearbox directly on there and wound it, well, it's going to have to turn that gearbox backwards. It doesn't work that way. So what we do is we put an electromagnetic clutch on it. It drives a 90 volts, but it's got a delay to it. So when the power comes on from this switch, closing the relays, you can hear them snapping. You can watch them if you so wish. When that closes the switch, it turns on that motor and starts the timer. The timer goes on for 60 seconds and then it kicks power onto the clutch. Once it hits power to the clutch, the clock winds. Any questions? We're going to hit it. We're going to stall for 60 seconds. See if we can tell a joke or something. Already? Yep. Go ahead and hit it. I think it's on. Relays closed, motor started. Let's go with those little orange timers. That's right. Inside there, you can, if you look inside the box, I left it open for the electrician. There's a timer. It's a variable timer, so you can change it to whatever you want. This time, I'm not going to stop it. Did you see that clutch is not engaged? Then once it does, it'll try to drive the pinion, which will wind up the cable, and then pull the weight up until it hits that shutoff switch. Got about 25 more seconds. Let her go. They might as well see it shut off. Should be somewhere in about five seconds. We didn't even, the clock did not stop. Those springs kept it running by that period of time. Thanks to Mr. Harrison. The maintenance on that, there's four bearings that need to be oiled and it's in your instructions, it's simple. There are oil ports on both sides. A good rule for oiling is never put oil in any place you can't get it out. <laughs> it's gotta go someplace, right? That will flush itself out. So at the end of the year or whenever the maintenance is, when we let down all the power, you take a screwdriver, pull that bushing, wipe it all clean, all that sort of stuff, put it all back in there and do the same on the other side. And that's it, guys and ladies. Now, the bushing stand here should be oil, correct? It's, well, all that is in your manual, yes. All shafts, it's got a, a bearing up top, I mean, a bearing hole up top see here. see the holes, the holes right. on the top. Yeah, they're both, same way on the other side. Maybe two, two squirts. Doesn't matter to me, except that when it comes out, see it coming out the bottom? Wipe it. Wipe it up. Yeah. So I should be able to come back here in 10 years and it should not be the same. I mean, it should be the it's same. As clean as it is now. You yes. don't even know, you'll be 80 years old. <laughs> Stop that. Don't tell these people that. <laughs> now look at everybody's got my telephone number. Don't hesitate to call. You can't absorb all this, and I don't expect you to. Somebody will get you the answer you need.